Hello. By way of introduction, I'm Nan Barbas. I'm a clinical neurologist with a focus on cognitive disorders in my practice and research. I'll be talking about the clinical evaluation of dementia. I've divided the topic into two parts. In part one, we will discuss a general approach to patients presenting with cognitive change and the routine evaluation as recommended by the National Institute on Aging Alzheimer's Association guidelines. In part two, there will be a case-based discussion of symptoms and conditions that warrant more extensive testing, that labeled optional testing in the National Institute on Aging Alzheimer's Association guidelines, or NIAA for short. Let's get started. First, there's no disclosures of conflicts or uh, relevant affiliations uh, related to this presentation. Our lesson outline for this segment is to begin with a clinical evaluation uh, description of goals and benefits. Then we will talk about the causes of cognitive, cognitive dysfunction and dementia in a general sense. I'll be more specific discussing the routine evaluation of cognitive impairment and dementia. There will be a brief overview of optional testing and then a summary and references. There are a number of goals to completing clinical evaluations in individuals presenting with concerns regarding change in cognition. First of all, one needs to establish whether dementia is present. It is important to characterize the nature and severity of cognitive impairment, to determine any functional consequences of the impairment, and then to determine an etiology. There are many sources that referrals of individuals seeking evaluation for dementia come from. These may come from the patient who initiates the request them themselves. It may come from an informant, such as a caregiver, spouse, adult children, or other family members or a close friend. Sometimes referrals come from mental health care providers, such as a psychotherapist or social worker. And sometimes the courts become involved due to legal concerns. There are a number of benefits of early evaluation for cognitive concerns. Medical benefits include things like identifying a cause and arriving at a specific diagnosis so that a more precise set of recommendations, treatments, and interventions can be provided. Also, early evaluation allows for reduced morbidity of reversible and contributing conditions. And finally, there's a contribution to the design of a personalized comprehensive care plan when assessment is sought early. There are also psychological and social benefits of early evaluation. These include items such as respecting patient autonomy, allowing the patient to be their own individual in a stage of illness where they're able to actively engage in their own assessment and care. It permits open discussion about their prognosis, safety, risks, treatment, and research participation. It allows for communication amongst healthcare professionals and social services. It permits patients to plan for their future and promotes understanding, hope, and reassurance. I want to mention the importance of the annual wellness visit. This is a mandated requirement that came into being when the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2011 was passed. Amongst the requirements for completing an annual wellness evaluation is detective, detection of cognitive impairment. Additional components include obtaining patients' vitals, medical and family history, reviewing medication list, medical provider list, a preventive service plan, and undertaking a depression screen at least at the time of the first wellness visit. So why is this important? We know that cognitive impairment is under-recognized in primary care in particular. Studies indicate that 27 to 81 percent of affected individuals go unrecognized. Early diagnosis, again, can improve the access to treatments, care plans and services, caregiver support, and opportunities for future planning. Before moving on, I'd like to review the difference between normal aging, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. In normal aging, it's common for individuals to occasionally have loss of memory for words and names, to have slowing of their processing speed, and to have difficulty sustaining attention, especially when faced with competing environmental stimuli. But there is no functional impairment. 
in mild cognitive impairment, memory is impaired beyond that expected for age, and has been noticed noticeably increasing over at least six or perhaps 12 months. Memory impairment may not be the only cognitive function that is, has declined. There may be difficulties in executive functioning, visual spatial skills, attention, other areas of function. But the daily function that the person is exhibiting is not significantly impaired. The individual is not demented, therefore. And these symptoms sometimes res resolve or improve over time. In dementia, we see memory impairment and impairment in at least one other cognitive domain, such as language, planning, organization, spatial processing, motor processing, or behavior. These difficulties are progressive, they're generally non-reversible, and function is impaired. So the provider's task is to discern the different causes of cognitive dysfunction or dementia. There are many different possibilities, and here are some of the major categories that should be considered. Medical conditions causing cognitive symptoms are many. I'll just highlight a few that you see on this screen, those that are the, uh, amongst those that are tested for when we undertake a routine evaluation. Vitamin B12 deficiency, organ failure such as liver or kidney disease, metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities, endocrine abnormalities such as thyroid dysfunction, and vascular disorders which can be noted on imaging studies which is a routine requirement in the evaluation. Medications commonly cause changes in cognition and it is very important in this geriatric population to keep this in mind as the long list of medications that many of our patients are prescribed or take over the counter may be contributing to changes in their thinking. Medications that should be reviewed include sedatives, hypnotics, tranquilizers, antidepressant, anxiolytics, anticholinergic medications, narcotics, and any combinations. There are other conditions that cause symptoms that mimic dementia or cognitive change. These can include items such as psychiatric illness, sensory impairment including changes in vision, hearing or sensation, disorders that affect attention including disordered sleeping, also premorbid literacy, education, and language differences may contribute to an impression that a dementia is present. The routine evaluation as recommended by the National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's Association consists of the following components. Taking a thorough history, performing a thorough physical and neurologic examination, undertaking a cognitive screening examination, screening for depression, laboratory assessment should include a complete blood count, chemistries, thyroid levels, and vitamin B12, and a form of neuroimaging should be undertaken. In taking a dementia history, it is important to start with open-ended questions. It is equally important to touch on topics that a patient or their informant may not be thinking are relevant to the conversation. So these can include things like understanding if they have difficulty recalling recent events and conversations, difficulty keeping track of personal items, difficulty managing their finances or assembling business papers. They may have discovered that it is, they are no longer able to shop alone or play a game of skill or work on their hobbies. Perhaps they are having difficulty with other household tasks. They may forget material that they've recently read. They may forget to, to attend appointments or family events. They may be having difficulty managing their medications and there may have been driving difficulties that the patient or someone they know have observed. There are additional symptoms that may be associated in taking in a dementia history. These may provide clues for different etiologies. Items such as change in appetite and weight should be assessed. Unusual sleep patterns, change in posture or gait, or the occurrence of falls 
changes in personality, mood, and behavior. And psychosis, such as hallucinations and delusions, should be assessed. It can be meaningful to administer a formal functional impairment assessment. And questions that should be assessed include those that re refer to basic activities of daily living and those relevant to instrumental activities of daily living. I want to stress the importance of obtaining information from an informant. This can take place either in, in person or in writing. It's helpful to know that the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, passed in 2003, otherwise known as HIPAA, does not disallow physicians or healthcare providers from hearing information that an informant wants to provide. The physical and neurologic examination is another key component to routine assessment. A general examination should emphasize the cardiovascular system, but also assess for thyroid and other general medical problems. A complete neurologic examination should be undertaken, and in particular, one should be looking for asymmetries, things that may be referable to structural lesions of the central nervous system, other clues such as altered gait and altered speech. There are a number of cognitive screening examinations available that one can apply in this setting. I call your attention to the Cognitive Assessment Toolkit available through the Alzheimer's Association. I want to focus on two of the older assessments that we have available um, and just point out some differences and when they may be applicable. Very familiar to most practitioners is Folstein's Mini Mental Status Examination. This is a 30-point screening tool. I've pointed out the points available for different aspects of this examination, and you'll notice that out of the 30 points that an individual can achieve, 16 have to do with orientation, registration, and recall. In other words, things that do rely quite a bit on memory. The Montreal Cognitive Assessment is also a 30-point screening tool. In this instance, orientation and recall compose 11 out of the 30 points, and there is a greater emphasis placed on language and executive functioning. So there is somewhat of a broader assessment that can be made by administering the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Again, as an overview, all of these evaluations take in the range of 5 to 20 minutes to administer. It is important to do a depression screening. Again, there are a number of scales that can be administered. The geriatric depression scale can be administered by an interviewer, which is helpful in this population. This is a brief review of the laboratory assessment that is part of the routine evaluation. And lastly, cranial imaging is recommended. It is not specified whether a cranial CT scan or a magnetic resonant image is the image of choice. It is common that, again, in this population, cranial MRIs are contraindicated due to the presence of a pacemaker or other metal or due to a patient's intolerance. The optional testing recommended by the National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's Association is a more complete list that can be applied in instances where a clear diagnosis is not available by undertaking the routine testing. We'll review this more in part two. In summary, change in cognition is a common presenting symptom in physician offices and is mandated as a routine screening component for annual wellness examinations. Basic assessment of cognitive changes includes thorough history, physical, and neurologic examination, screening mental status testing, basic laboratory analysis, and brain imaging. Medications and concurrent medical and psychiatric conditions often contribute to cognitive changes. And information provided by an informant can be invaluable. Thank you very much.